My name is Ryan Martinez. Uh, I am currently an instructional designer at UW Extension Continuing Education Outreach and E-Learning, CEOEL, so nobody ever knows what that actually means, um, and a graduate student in the Department of Curriculum Instruction here at UW-Madison. Um, so as John had alluded to, one of my primary responsibilities when I was a grad student here was that I helped design and TA uh, the very first MOOC that we offered here at UW-Madison, Video Games and Learning. Um, roughly the facts kind of go through a really brief overview. So Video Games and Learning, and that's actually artwork that we never used, and I thought that was a really nice artwork, the one at the top, the logo there. Uh, launched 2013, it was six weeks long. We originally envisioned it to be a 10-week course and then realized 10 weeks in a MOOC would be absolutely insane. Uh, and so we thankfully brought it down to six weeks, which saved me some hours of sleep. Uh, over 59,000 people enrolled in the class. So, uh, one of the really amazing statistics about this is that we had around 10,000 people enroll in the class after it launched. So once the course concluded up until like July, we had 10,000 extra people enroll. Uh, we actually still have people enrolling. We left the course open, so people still drop in. We, you know, uh, one of the videos that I'm going to show you is actually a homework submission from a student who submitted it two months ago. So there are people still kind of dropping in, which is really awesome. Uh, 190 different countries, uh, so we had many people from all over. And our class was uh, generally mixed with crowdsourced activities, experiments, readings, videos, sort of infographics. We really wanted to cover a broad spectrum because we didn't exactly know who our student would be. It could be a PhD student, it could be a graduate student, it could be a mother, a grandfather. Uh, a uh, we had a nine-year-old uh, child enroll in our class, which was pretty awesome. Um, the class was taught by Professors Kurt Squire and Professor Stein Constance Steinkuhler, and we used a lot of works from um, Constance's advisor, which is uh, Dr. James G. So how we wanted to approach the course was that we always, um, we, um, the whole idea is that learning is sort of happens in like these apprenticeships and learning from games as these really interesting systems uh, sort of apprentices the player to become like an expert. Uh, and so it was sort of, we were trying to teach content about the whole, kind of like a very broad scope of the field of games-based learning. And we wanted to make sure that we sort of kind of gradually brought people in because we didn't exactly know what the buy-in would be for several people that would enroll in this course. Uh, and so we wanted to sort of ease them into the process of how we approach games from a research perspective and sort of allow them to kind of situate themselves in roles that we take as academics to kind of gradually gear them towards being sort of like a professional, someone that could look at games in a different lens. Um, so we didn't want to go with quizzes, really, or uh, you know, typical homework assignments. Uh, there is an undergraduate course on campus of video games and learning. That's a Comm B course. We have to require public speaking and writing. Uh, but we didn't want them to write papers Goodness knows we wouldn't be able to look through all of them. Um, and we wanted to make sure that they could get some value from these activities. And so one of the activities that we've done in the class on campus is we have normally a student play through a game, we say about an hour, hour and a half, and have them break down how the game was designed to teach them how to play it. So was it a good design to help kind of scaffold information for them to allow them to become comfortable with the content and proceed and get some sort of mastery? Was it not working so well? <clears throat> and so we really wanted to use that in this course because we didn't want to do typical quizzes and regular assignments. We wanted to do something just a little bit different. And so one of the things that we tried to do was we wanted them to create YouTube videos of them walking through a game and kind of discussing it, reflecting, you know, how it worked for them, what didn't work for them, and sort of share that with us. So we had discussion forums for each week, and then week one was the students would submit the assignment, usually with a YouTube link, and we'd go to it, and they'd watch it, and people would comment. And the week one assignment, because, you know, there's people that still don't want to do homework, um, and that was perfectly fine with us. We had over 3,000 different submissions. Now the 3,000 also includes the YouTube videos, and there are a lot that also just submitted via text their reflection because they felt uncomfortable uh, doing the YouTube video, and that for us was completely fine. So what it looked like. Um, essentially, was we would have basically a lot of people using their webcams to record the reflections. 
Um, there was an up, in, up and down vote system that we tried to implement so that the ones that would be the most insightful would kind of rise to the top. Um, but that was sort of, had a chilling effect also because for every like positive votes they got, some people got very negative votes. And we found out really quickly, obviously, if you get a video that you recorded and people don't like it, and this is your first week assignment, and it's a voluntary class, you're not going to stay with it. So we kind of sent out a really fast blurb of don't do that anymore, that was our mistake. I mean, because we were approaching the MOOC, this was the first MOOC that was launched. And we had people that had experience with online course design. I had experience and everybody else had experience on the team. But on this massive scale, we simply just didn't know. And so we were kind of designing it and seeing what worked and what didn't. I still think we still did a really good job. But for a lot of the videos that we had, we did have a lot of text of people reflecting on these things. Um, one of the reasons, I mean, and there were several, was also what we didn't uh, realize, and now that I think about it, we should have realized this sooner, is that we had a lot of students from China. And China does not have access to YouTube. So we had to figure out a really quick way for them to be able to make videos and post them. Because there were certain countries that where we had citizens taking the class that they couldn't access some content because of the firewall issues. Um, we didn't work through all of them, but China also has a YouTube equivalent. I believe it's called UQ. And we were able to kind of get some videos from them uh, as well. So that was a nice sort of work through. And this was kind of, in general, what some of the videos looked like. Hopefully this works. So as you can see, it wasn't necessarily, we didn't want them to be deeply insightful about things. It was just sort of to get them to understand games as learning systems and to analyze it that way. And so in that case, he did a very good job of it. He was reflecting on it and looking at it differently. And using the YouTube video, he was able to kind of get that across on screen. Now this kind of does come back to, you know, why I'm even speaking here. Why did we use YouTube videos is because we wanted to make sure we wanted to really leverage the idea that we were going to have this massive audience of students and they were going to be coming from different demographics and backgrounds and different learning styles and different types of comprehension of games or games and instruction. And we wanted to make sure that they all had a form in which they could share these ideas because we figured that, you know, while professors Kurt Squire and Constance Einkuller obviously know an enormous amount about the field, we wanted fresh perspectives as well. And so having, using YouTube and allowing other people to watch these videos and to comment on them and knowing that we were also watching these videos because we would give weekly sort of summaries at the next week. So we would watch some of this stuff, we would watch some of the work that they were doing and then we would record videos of us kind of responding to some of the queries that they had or concerns and kind of walking through content so that we were following along. But it was the whole idea that by using YouTube by using the discussion forums, we are allowing not only students to sort of empower themselves with the voice and having that video to do so, but at the same time we were seeing sort of creations along the weeks of mentor roles. So we had several students that sort of took on a mentorship role of other students. And they would walk, they were almost like unofficial TAs. So they would walk through some of the material when students didn't understand. I believe we had a professor in Australia who I'm almost sure never slept because he was always posting on the message forums. And I'd get up 
I would wake up in the middle of the night to check some of the message forms to kind of compensate for Europe and Australia, and he would already be posting. I didn't sleep really much during the six weeks, and I thought that was going to be the easy time. Um, I was really wrong. Um, but he would always be posting. Um, there was another one, I believe she's a primary school teacher in England. She was posting as well. And so they sort of took a lot of people under their wing. And allowing sort of these things, we, you know, we didn't say, no, don't do that. We were actually encouraging, like, yes, do these activities, record these videos. Like, we really want you guys to sort of take ownership of this. And a lot of them did. We had Facebook groups that were devoted to, um, you know, if there was a language that it was that the content was not translated in, they would translate it. And so we had Facebook groups for Portuguese speakers, for Greek speakers, for Russian speakers. And they created them entirely on their own. And that was fantastic. But um, that's kind of an aside. So I guess right now what we're going to try to do is I'm going to, should I take questions now? Some questions or? Yeah. How would you like to? Does anyone have any questions? Yes. So the downvoting, I can't remember. Did you say you turned it off or you just encouraged people not to download? So we couldn't turn it off because that was a feature that we just couldn't get rid of. Uh -huh. um, but we did strongly encourage and we put out a bullet or a, you know like a thread and told people you know this is don't downvote because that's discouraging to students that was a mix up on our part the way that we saw it was that we were thought thought we would get like the top responses and then we could answer those but yeah it did have that chilling effect of when you did get downvoted that kind of hurt because you know we were asking them to sort of invest in us and you know they were getting low rankings so we strongly encouraged them not to downvote. It still did happen. We had flare-ups of incidents um, in some of the discussion threads where downvoting did happen. Uh, but you know, when you have a free class and 59,000 people enroll, you're going to have trolls, unfortunately. And so basically it was us trying to stop that as much as possible. How many of you have used videos in your courses before where you have students create videos? Anyone? How many of you have made YouTube videos before? All right, we're going to focus on. Excellent. Other videos, not like with iMovie or Windows Movie Maker or something like that? Yeah. <coughs> Asia. Excellent. Did so you need to put out information for students on this? Was that really made clear about how to go about making a YouTube video? Or is that something you kind of just expect people to know how to do? Or <coughs> so we did a brief instruction of how to record the video. Um, and then we also, so uh, the slide here. Um, she actually, uh, this is Emily maybe, she worked with uh, the Games Learning Society group for a while and I had asked her to make some uh, seed videos of actual doing the walk through the games because we wanted to give the students some sort of idea as to what they should be looking for, not necessarily like saying, look at this, look at this, talk about this. Um, and so we kind of guided them that way. Um, but some of them did still have trouble and again, some of those, the people in the mentorship roles sort of kind of took them under their wing and kind of explained the process to them. Yes? What were some of the payoffs of the course? Were the course objectives or what was the, like when you made the video, what were you supposed to be getting out of that creation of the video? What was the, the So it was basically sort of, um, you know, okay, so how we approached it in the regular class was that we play games and we sort of approach them in a very same way, like we put in the game cartridge and we play. But we don't ever, you know, we're thinking about the learning that's going on, but we never really think and label it as learning itself, right? It's, I'm learning how to play this game, but there's actual learning. They're structuring it so that I learn the game space and learn the system and can work within the system to gain some sort of competency. Um, and we never really think about that until we're asked, you know, well, well, how did you learn to play the game? And people go, huh, well, I didn't really think about it that way. And so this was sort of them kind of being able to vocalize like exactly the things that they thought were there to teach them how to play. Um, and for this, this was the week one assignments. We wanted to kind of really ease them in um, to kind of just, you know, go with you're learning in a game and you probably just don't think about it. But you're learning and you can analyze that on your own. You don't necessarily need us for that. Um, and so that was basically the purpose of that. And for those who did the YouTube videos, I can't say like everybody got it, but um, I think a lot of them did sort of critically reflect. Uh, a lot of the text ones that we had too were also very good because they kind of could write out to reflection, but more like the vocalization, like they could get it out there of, you know, this is how I think I'm learning in the game and, oh yeah, that's an actual learning activity. Yeah, so it does work. Yeah. 